Well, uh, thank you, Arun, for the uh, very kind uh, introduction. And uh, I'd uh, like to thank you for coming here. Uh, and I uh, also thank the organizer for inviting me for this very exciting meeting. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, controlling part of our work in controlling thermal radiation uh, for energy application. Now, uh, thermal radiation is uh, one of the ubiquitous aspects of nature. So uh, the sun, of course, is a a uh, very hot body at 6,000 Kelvin, and that radiate heat into us, and that's where the entire solar energy is built upon. Uh, every one of us on Earth, and I really mean every one of us in this room, actually emits substantial amount of thermal radiation as well. Uh, but of course, you usually associate thermal radiation with a picture like this. If you stand in front of a fire, you get the radiation coming to you, and get you, you get heat up. Now finally, um, the, uh, one of the interesting things that I'm going to emphasize on is the universe itself. And that does not emit much of thermal radiation because it's very, very cold. But you receive thermal radiation. So uh, thermal radiation is really an ubiquitous aspect of nature that are very strongly associated with many of the energy conversion processes. Um, in this talk, uh, I'm going to try to talk about a somewhat unusual uh, renewable energy application. And that actually has something to do with the uh, universe itself. So uh, if you look up in the sky, and of course the first thing you see, especially during the daytime, is the sun. And at 6,000 Kelvin is a fantastic energy source. On the other hand, away from the sun, uh, there's the universe itself that's actually very cold. And one way to estimate its temperature is, say, to, to say 3 Kelvin. Now, something that's cold is actually very important for energy conversion. One of the basic uh, thermodynamic fact concerns if you want to convert heat into work uh, is the Carnot analysis, which says that if you want to get a high efficiency process, you like to have a high temperature heat source. For example, the sun at 6,000 Kelvin is fantastic for that. You also, on the other hand, would like a low temperature heat sink. Now, the vast majority of the energy conversion process on Earth dump the heat into Earth at a temperature of 300 Kelvin. On the other hand, the universe is a lot colder. And it would be good if instead one can use universe for this purpose. So uh, that's really the part of my talk. So uh, I like to talk about a sequence of recent work where we try to think along this direction to develop a strategy to use the universe as a renewable resource. I'm going to talk about a direct use of it as a radiative cooling, which has potential to reduce electricity consumption for air conditioning. I'm also going to talk about some more speculative idea. One of them has to do with trying to do radiative cooling on solar cell to lower the solar cell temperature. And then a technique complementary to solar cell where we use PN junction dial to try to direct extract power from radiation into a cold background. So let me start with the first part. Um, one of the important things about radiation, about thermal radiation, is that it provides remote wireless access to thermodynamic resources. Uh, for example, no one working on solar energy actually have to sit in the sun to do solar energy research. And very similarly, in fact, you do not have to be sitting in the outer space to benefit from the existence of outer space. The black curve here is the transmission spectrum of the atmosphere. An important fact is that the atmosphere is actually quite transparent. The transmission efficiency is actually pretty high in the wavelengths range from 8 to 13 micron. And that actually coincide with the peak of the black body spectrum around 300 Kelvin. So every one of us, when we step outside this room, and if the sky is clear, we are actually radiating heat out into the outer space. And therefore, that becomes an intrinsic cooling mechanism. And one therefore should be used to use that mechanism for cooling purposes. And this actually has been known for many, many years. There's a technology called nighttime radiative cooling. Uh, at night, you can take a black emitter, go to the roof in a clear night, have that thing face the sky, the heat will come out. And as a result, its temperature will drop. 
And this is actually a, a well-known technology. Uh, one of the buildings at Stanford actually uses this technology to produce cold water. However, it has not been very widely adopted, and that for a number of reasons. Now, one of them being that, well, if you care about cooling, you probably care about it more when the things are hotter, and things are usually hotter during the day. Now, during the daytime, of course, you would not take a piece of black emitter, go to the roof, and hope to see any cooling, and because the sun is shining on top of you. So from that argument, it's actually relatively straightforward to imagine what you actually need to do to do daytime radiative cooling. What you would need is a emissivity profile of a material that looks like this, that it has no emissivity in the solar wavelength side, so that it's a very good mirror of the sunlight, but is a perfect black body in the 8 to 30 micron window, it emit all the thermal radiation. And remarkably, such a structure has never been constructed before. So uh, the first thing we did is we used numerical simulation to design some of these structures. And here are some of our initial design. So we try to design a broadband solar mirror by a chirp multi-layer film. And then on top of it, we put a uh, photonic crystal made of quartz, uh, made of silica, uh, silicon dioxide and silica. These are materials that, through its lattice vibration, has a very strong phonon plyoton response. And consequently, it emits very strongly thermal radiation. And if you look at the calculated emissivity spectrum, it has very low emissivity in the solar spectral side. So that is a very good mirror, but it has strong emissivity in the 8 to 13 micron window, so it can emit heat out. With this, with the spectrum that I show you, you can compute the cooling performance of this device. Uh, one measure of it is something called equilibrium temperature. Suppose you have this thing on roof and you allow a perfect insulator surrounding it, but a sky access. In this case, it reflects all the sunlight so it doesn't get heated up by the sun, but you radiate the heat out, so its temperature is going to drop. And you can ask, for a given ambient air temperature, where is the temperature going to reach for this cooling device? Using the spectra I just show you, theoretically, you could actually get a temperature of about 260 Kelvin for an ambient of 300 Kelvin. In other words, in a hot summer day at noon, there is actually potential that you can get ice out of this in an entirely passive way without using any electricity. And that's a very unusual uh, potential for the future. Alternatively, because this thing has a temperature lower than the ambient, you can put a heat load in there. As you put a heat load in, its temperature is going to rise. And you can ask, how much heat load can I put to drive its temperature back to the ambient air temperature? That number turned out to be on the order, theoretically, of about 100 watt per meter square. Uh, 100 watt per meter square, of course, is a non-trivial amount of power. Order of magnitude-wise, this is where solar power sits. And there's a good thermodynamic reason for that particular aspect. From a more practical point of view, a significant portion of the US energy consumption in building, about 15% or so, goes into air conditioning. So being able to cut that down with this kind of radiated cooling technique can actually make impact in the global energy consumption. So motivated by the theoretical work, we then set out to try to do some experimental demonstration. Here are some initial experiments where we try to reproduce some of the nighttime experiments that people have done before, but with a very simple structure of a silicon dioxide putting on aluminum uh, in a cool summer night where the ambient air temperature is about 13 degrees Celsius, this thing very quickly gets to freezing. And that, of course, uh, is at night, but it says that you can really cool down things by radiation. Daytime is uh, quite a bit harder. So what we did is we actually made a structure on eight-inch wafer. These are Ashwas Raman and Lin Xiao Zhu. Lin Xiao was sitting down there, who are some of the primary uh, students and postdocs did the work. Uh, and the eight-inch, these are eight-inch silicon wafer. And on the wafer, we grow layers uh, made of silicon dioxide and the half mm oxide. These materials, silicon dioxide, as I mentioned, has strong phonon plyoton response. And therefore, the top three layers on the thickness, with thickness on the order of a few hundred nanometers, is used to radiate the heat out. 
the bottom four layer have thickness on the order of tens of nanometer. This in combination of a silver layer forms a broadband mirror to reflect the sunlight. And uh, shown here is the solar reflection spectrum. This, you can see that it has very little emissivity over the entire solar spectrum except somewhere on the UV. And uh, also, so it has actually is a very good mirror as you see in the picture that I just showed you, yet it emits very strongly in the A to 13 micron window. Made this sample, we then put it on the roof. This is the roof of the uh, electrical engineering building. Uh, so this is our setup. Now, one of the important points about the roof is that under the sun is actually a very hot place. Anything on the roof actually absorbs quite a bit of sunlight, and the result is temperature is actually very high. Our objective here is to demonstrate cooling below ambient air temperature. So this, in a way, is trying to design, trying to demonstrate cooling in the oven. And there's quite a bit of challenge in thermal design that we had to overcome in order to see the effect. So uh, one of the key points that we eventually ended up doing is to create what we call an air pocket, a transparent box around the radiative cooler so that nothing in direct contact with the air around the radiative cooler actually will be heated up by the sun. We also use a low density polyethylene film, which is actually kitchen wrap, to seal the pocket. This cuts down the convection and again serves the thermal purposes. With this setup, we can then test a large number of different things under the sun. So for example, if you put black pen there, the temperature very quickly rise up to 80 degrees Celsius. Not surprising, of course, you do solar thermal with this. Somewhat more interestingly, if you put aluminum in there, you will have a temperature, even though aluminum is a very good reflector already, you will still have very substantial heating effect on the order of about 20 degrees Celsius below above ambient. The cooler that we put in is the only structure that actually has a lower temperature uh, under the sun. And here is a blow up view of it. You can see that it actually has a temperature that's about five degree below ambient under the peak sunlight of about 900 watt per meter square. And one of the very interesting thing is actually in here, when we bring the cooler up, we initially cover it so that it doesn't see the sky and it has a temperature that's at ambient temperature. We then take off the cover, then it sees the sun. Our everyday experience, of course, is that if you see the sun, your temperature rises. Uh, this device actually does the opposite. It sees the sun and its temperature drops. And that's, of course, a key point of radiative cooling. It gives you require sky access for these kind of a cooling in order to occur. So this five degree drop is a measurement of the equilibrium temperature. We also did a cooling power measurement by taking this device, put a heating power intentionally, and see its temperature rise. So without the instant power, without the input electrical power, it has a temperature somewhere between minus four and minus degree, five degrees Celsius below ambient. Put the heat in, its temperature start to rise. And it took about 40 watt per meter square of input heat power in order to drive the device temperature back at ambient. And that's a direct measurement experimentally of the cooling power of the structure that we have built. So uh, what we show here is a proof of principle demonstration of a device that actually cools under ambient sunlight. We also think that this is a device that has a performance that's actually far below what the theoretical limit will allow you to do. And so what we're trying to do at the moment is to scale this up so that we can actually demonstrate a electricity saving in air conditioning system as well as trying to do more engineering to further improve the performance. On the other hand, there are really a lot of the structures under the sun that actually require cooling. So uh, in the second part of my talk, I'm going to switch gear just a little bit again to talk about cooling. But in this case, for an absorber rather than a mirror. So in the first case here, we're talking about a mirror. Now, uh, in many cases, you would not want to reflect all the sunlight because you actually want to use it. But the sunlight, in the same time, also heat up the structure. And a prominent example is something called so is the cooling need in the solar cell. 
Solar cell, of course, does not sit in a solar simulator. It has to go up on the roof. And as a result, it's actually going to heat up very substantially. A typical operating temperature of a solar cell can be as high as 50 to 55 degrees Celsius. And this has very severe uh, efficiency penalty as well as lifetime penalty. So being able to develop a technique to cool solar cell is extremely important. Now, the solar cell sees the sky. So a very natural thing, given what we have done in radiated cooling, is to say, well, can we use the sky to cool down the solar cell? So uh, if you take just a silicon wafer by itself, it has strong solar absorption, which is what you want. But it has very relatively little thermal emission out of the structure. And so it by itself would not do substantial radiative cooling. What you would like to do is to put something on top of it that does not affect the solar absorption, but significantly boost the emissivity in the 8 to 13 micron window. And that should allow you to radiatively cool down a solar absorber while preserving the solar absorbing properties. And so as a, again, a uh, initial proof of principle demonstration, uh, we try to demonstrate radiated cooling of a solar absorber. So we start with a bare silicon wafer. Uh, these are wafers that are typically used as a starting point for solar cell. Then for cooling purposes, we compare this to two different structures. One of them has a thick layer of silica, about 500 micron thick silica layer. This is partially to simulate, and in, uh, a because in the actual solar cell structure, there will be a thick silica layer on top. So this partially to simulate that. And then also, we put in, compare that with a structure with a silica photonic crystal on top. And that was optimized for thermal radiation properties. So uh, this is the SNA image of a silica photonic crystal. The periodicity here is on the order of six micron or so, so that you get enhanced thermal radiation. And we compare these three structure. First, we compare their optical and thermal radiation properties. And uh, shown on the left here is the absorptivity spectrum of all three structures in the solar wavelength range, the yellow region, the yellow a curve here uh, is the AM 1.5 solar spectrum. So what you see is a very typical absorptivity spectrum of silicon that you have uh, above band gap, you have absorption. Below, you have weaker absorption. And the three structures have very similar solar absorption uh, property. In fact, the photonic crystal sample has a slightly higher absorption compared with the other two samples because of some light trapping effect coming out of engineering the silica surface. On the thermal side, on the long wavelength side, on the other hand, the property of the three structures are very different. The black curve here is the bare silicon sample, as I mentioned. It has relatively weak thermal emission. The blue curve here is the thick silica, uniform silica layer, about 500 micron thick on top of silicon. Silica has a strong phonon plyoton response. Consequently, the thermal radiation goes up quite a bit compared with the bare silicon region. But because of the index mismatch, between silica and air, there is actually a pronounced dip inside the transparency window uh, uh, of the atmosphere. And therefore, a thick silica layer is actually not optimum for radiation cooling purposes. The red curve here is the silica photonic crystal uh, solar uh, thermal emission spectrum. In this case, it has an emissivity that's near unity due to the use of photonic crystal. So what we have created here with the silica photonic crystal is actually a structure that's visibly transparent. It looks like any regular glass, but it behaves as a thermal black body, which is a somewhat unusual uh, structure compared, I guess, with your typical view of what a black body will look like. Uh, again, we compare all these structures on roof. So we compare the uh, planar silica structure, the photonic crystal structure on one of the, these little chamber. And as comparison in the other chamber, we put in two bare silicon sample. 
And again, under the sun, you can see the bare silicon sample actually heats up very substantially due to the solar absorption. The both the planar silica sample and the photonic crystal sample, on the other hand, has much lower temperature. And also, out of the three structure, the photonic crystal sample consistently has the lowest temperature in spite of the fact that it has the highest solar absorption. The temperature drop here is as large as 13 degrees Celsius. Now, to translate into an estimate of efficiency, if you can cool down a solar cell temperature by about 13 degrees Celsius, this will translate into an efficiency gain on the order of a percentage point, which, as you heard from Homer's talk in the very beginning, uh, even a 0.1 percentage point improvement in silicon solar cell efficiency took enormous amount of effort. So I think this is actually a very interesting uh, opportunity to do radiation control in order to improve solar cell efficiency in a practical operating environment. So finally, um, in the very last part of my talk, I'd like to talk about some of our recent work where we try to directly get energy out of the universe itself. So uh, try to actually develop an idea that we can directly generate electricity out of the uh, universe itself. So, and this actually requires uh, a somewhat unusual physics about photodiode that uh, has not been extensively explored. So uh, every solar cell, of course, is a photodiode. Uh, in this case, you have a hot body having the sun sending light into the solar cell, the photodiode, sitting at a 300 Kelvin. And the incoming photon drive the diode away from equilibrium and consequently allow you to extract electricity from the, uh, consequently allow you to extract electricity uh, from the photodiode. And that's the typical operation of a photovoltaic cell. Now, one of the very interesting physics that has not been explored uh, is the, to do the opposite. Suppose, again, you have the photovoltaic cell or you have the diode, but instead of facing a hot object such as the sun, you allow it to face a cold object, for example, the universe. In this case, the lack of radiation from the environment again would drive the photodiode away from equilibrium. And as a result, you will also generate a current and a voltage. And in this case, the photodiode actually behave as a thermal engine that convert part of the thermal radiation into electricity. And it differs from the conventional photodiode operation mode by the fact that it now sits on the hot side rather than the cold side of this thermal conversion process. So uh, this can, under the operation of this, can actually be understood by a detailed balance analysis of the photodiode in the conventional operation mode. So if there is no uh, object that have temperature different from the diode, uh, if you plot the IV curve here, you get the black curve. So the curve pass through the origin uh, when the V equal to zero, I equal to zero. Now, if you have a hot object, you generate a positive open circuit voltage and a negative short circuit current. So you drive this curve down, and that's what typical PV cell operates. So you operate in the fourth quadrant of this IV curve, uh, uh, of this IV plane. On the other hand, if you are facing an object that's cold, the detail balance will require you at the open circuit voltage situation to develop a negative bias so that you can balance out the reduced incoming photon flux. And as a result, you push this curve into the second quadrant, which again is a quadrant that can be used to generate electrical power. So we did a uh, very simple proof of principle experiment to explore this physical regime. So what we did is we used a, a long wavelength photodiode. These are mercury zinc cadmium telluride 
uh, photodiode. And then uh, we basically have that diode facing a temperature controlled IR emissive surface. And to do reliable measurement, we put in an optical dropper. This is essentially look like a fan. And as it rotates, it will allow you to uh, vary it will allow you to, sometime that the diode will see the emissive surface, sometime it will not as the fan rotates. So in the case where it's facing a hot surface, as the dropper rotates, we look at the photocurrent as a function of time. When the dropper blocks the uh, light trajectory, you will have zero current. And then when the diode actually see the off surface, when the chopper is open, you will have a reduced current and therefore a negative current. Okay? And that's the typical photovoltaic operation mode. On the, and that basically corresponds to the shift of the IV curve into the fourth quadrant. On the other hand, if you face a cold surface, uh, the curve actually flip. In this case, again, when the chopper is closed so that the diode does not see the emissive surface, you don't have any current. And when the diode sees the emissive surface, you now have a positive current. And that's consistent with the shift of this curve into the second quadrant. So uh, in fact, if you were to compare these two curves, you will see a very distinctive 180 degree phase shift with respect to the chopper position as uh, when you look at the current as a function uh, of time. And in both cases, therefore, the diode can actually extract the power. And this is the measured power as a function of the surface temperature. The diode itself is 295 Kelvin. And on both sides, when it's facing the hot, a hot surface, and it's facing a cold surface on both sides, actually you can extract electrical power out of it. Now, uh, the diode that we use is a, a long wavelength run and is completely unoptimized for this kind of purposes. It's just something that we basically bought it commercially for typical photo detection. But on the other hand, uh, given an idea like that, one can ask, what exactly is the limit of the efficiency as well as the power density that you can get out of these kind of scheme. So we did a, uh, a theoretical analysis assuming a perfect dial without radiator combination uh, facing actually a three Kelvin background when the dial itself is sitting at 300 Kelvin. And the theory actually reveals two things. One of them is that with proper design, this kind of setup can actually reach Carnot limit in its efficiency. And therefore, it's actually a theoretical ideal scheme of benefiting from the thermal radiation from, for example, the Earth to a very cold background. The second point is that, well, uh, the maximum power density in terms of electricity that you can extract turned out to be on the order of 54 watt per meter square. In, at night, when there is no reliable, renewable energy resources, this actually, I don't think, is a trivial number to ignore. So I think there's actually very interesting potential uh, in this kind of idea here. So uh, to summarize, I hope to give you sort of an uh, overview of some of our recent work in trying to think about it, understanding how we can explore a very unusual thermodynamic resources. This is a resource that's actually enormous. Every photon that's coming in from the sun eventually have to be radiated out because the Earth's temperature is at steady state. So the amount of thermal radiation that the Earth is given out is exactly the same as the amount of power that the sun is given us. And so that's an enormous amount of radiation. And being able to benefit from that, I think, is quite interesting. Let me end by acknowledging uh, Ashwas Raman and Lin Xiao Zhu in particular in uh, the radiated cooling project. Lin Xiao on the solar cell cooling, he is actually giving a poster uh, today. Uh, so uh, feel free to talk to him, as well as Parsi Sansanam for the work on what we call negative illumination. So let me thank you for your attention.
question, but I, on the last one, the negative illumination. What's the uh, energy balance on that? I mean, how do you get energy out of giving off energy? How do you capture energy usefully? There's uh, no energy input into that system that I saw. There's no energy input. So what you do is actually you suck the energy from the ambient, and part of the energy get radiated out to the cold sink. And then the dial extract, part of that, uh, fr extract work from that part of the energy flow. So it's like any thermal engine that's extracting power from the heat flow. The only thing that's somewhat unusual is that sit on the hot side rather than the cold side. I would think that for the rooftop application, uh, the dollars per square meter for a photonic crystal would be challenging. Right. Um, and also for the solar cell, where a dollar per watt would be very challenging when you have far fewer watts. So um, my first question is, can you comment on the, on the cost issue? And then separately, can you say something about the angle of incidence behavior of the photonic crystal as the sun is moving across the sky? Right. Uh, so. Uh, I'll answer the second one, which is an easier one. This is actually a fairly broad angle uh, structure. Uh, so uh, essentially, the uh, emissivity does not change much uh, over about uh, uh, 50 or 60 degrees. Uh, this is not engineering the sunlight. So uh, it's basically what you would like is to have a, uh, when you need to radiate the heat out as much as possible, you need the emissivity to be somewhat independent of the angle. And the photonic crystal one actually behave that way. Uh, so uh, you can easily get 50, 60 degree, and the emissivity barely drop in many of these structures. So that part, uh, now the cost issue, uh, I think we talk about three things. And I think the first one is probably less speculative in terms of cost compared to the remaining two. So I'll focus on the first one. Uh, in the first one, what we are actually looking at here is simply a, uh, so first of all, the silicon layer that we use. Let me, let me go back to the, uh, right. Is there a way to? Um, right. Uh, first of all, the silicon layer here is completely irrelevant. So what you, all you need here is a passive structure that's like a mirror, but with a bit of dielectric coating on top. And uh, uh, that actually, in terms of material uh, cost, uh, as well as fabrication cost, would be a lot lower than typical solar cell. Uh, the solar cell cooling cost analysis we have not done. Because I think this is still at the stage where one would try to, uh, where we try to demonstrate the proof of principle demonstration. But uh, even a proper designed flat structure based on silica should already have substantial cooling capability. One may not need large scale fabrication in terms of lithography for it. Any other questions? I have one follow up. Yeah. Um, the last one is essentially using a thermal vector in reverse. Right. That's basically Mercat Telluride. Right. Small manga semiconductor. Right. Yeah. But on the on maybe I should use but on the second one, yeah. you know, in the same theme, the thermal cameras that are used, bolometer, mm -hmm. nitride is a great material. You already have nitride. Why do you need silica? Um well, the second one is you would need to reduce the temperature of a solar cell. So the thing has to be transparent. Yeah, so, uh, and I imagine that uh, uh, you would like a material that's very commonly used in, uh, co in standard silicon cell uh, and to try to further engineer that for cooling purposes. But I imagine one may actually get better performance with, uh, with other material as well. That could be quite interesting. Great. Well, let's thank Chenry again.